I want you to imagine what you were doing two weeks ago. Now I want to take you on a little bit of time travel and ask you to imagine that you are President Harry Truman sitting at your desk in the White House amidst the Second World War. Only two weeks ago did you uh, get a letter from your Secretary of State for War, Henry Stimson, saying that a new and exciting uh, but devastating weapon system has been developed. Like nothing else that we've ever seen before, you as president are going to have to make the decision about whether or not you're going to use it. Now, we'll do a little bit of a straw poll here. Could you just raise your hand for a split second if you think, as president, you would have used the nuclear weapon, the atomic bomb? Quick show of hands. Okay, that's a, a small, I think we're probably looking at about 15, 20%, if that, of the audience here today. We'll do another vote at the end. I want to see whether or not your opinions have changed. Now, we know that this was an extraordinarily dangerous, devastating, and contaminating weapon. And the best approach that we have found in humanity to deal with this particular system is to prevent its use, to minimize the stockpiles, and to prevent proliferation of it. But why was it used in 1945, and was there an alternative? So it is, I'm using some of those YouTube bits of footage we just heard about. There were effectively four um, reasons why uh, this weapon was used. Um, to hasten the end of the war, was the first reason given. This was obviously the most costly war, uh, war in the whole of human history. Uh, already, uh, by the time you're making your decision at your desk, uh, over 50 million people have been killed in this war. The second reason that was given was that the American public would not forgive leaders who they found out had possessed the means to save American lives, but had refused to use this weapon system to do so. The third reason was that the Japanese government, the army, and the people clearly intended to fight to the death. That was the argument given, this image from uh, the taking of uh, Okinawa. And the fourth reason was to make a major war in the future, unthinkable ever again, to prevent future war of this scale. A point that Robert, uh, J. Robert uh, Oppenheimer himself, of course, referred to. Now, there is a group that have um, arrived, if you like, uh, since 1945, the so-called revisionists historians. And the revisionists are trying to argue that the reason why the bomb was used at all was to impress the Soviets with the sheer power of the United States. They also argue uh, in some of the texts that somehow the Americans wanted to, uh, or rather Truman, wanted to win the next election. Here was his opportunity to do so. And the third reason advanced by the revisionists was revenge for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December the 7th, 1941. Now, like many other historians, I've been through the American National Archives, I've been through the correspondence of Truman and others, and I have found absolutely no evidence, no empirical evidence, to support the arguments put forward by the revisionists. They could not have foreseen the Cold War that was coming, and so this idea about impressing Soviets seems highly unlikely. In fact, it was the other way around. Truman wanted to share the idea of the technology of the bomb and was prevented from doing so by many of his colleagues. So what was the situation in early 1945? The United States and the Allies had endured surprise attacks in which thousands had been killed. China was the first to be subjected to Imperial Japanese uh, surprise offensives and both in 1931 in Mukden uh, incident, uh, Manchuria was overrun, and then in 1937, 
uh, the war was continued into China. Shanghai was bombarded uh, as a city by the Imperial Japanese in 1940. And as we've mentioned already, in 1941, Pearl Harbor and all of Southeast Asia, including Singapore, came under uh, this uh, relentless Imperial Japanese offensive. For the Americans, this resulted in a temporary loss of control of half of the Pacific Ocean and the Imperial military Japanese occupation with all the brutalities that came with it, all the atrocities that came with it throughout Southeast Asia uh, and uh, into the Pacific uh, region. Now, America tried to regain control uh, of uh, the Pacific, um, and um, it had lost uh, the Philippines in the early stages of the war. It uh, was clearly going to be unable to take that back with the meager military resources it possessed in late 1941. Australia came under Japanese air attack. The British had lost Singapore in the most ignominious defeat in British military history. And the prisoners that were taken, Australian, British, American, uh, those of the Southeast Asian nations, the Dutch and so on, were subjected to barbaric forms of abuse by their guards. There were big naval battles that many of you no doubt have heard of, the Battle of Midway, uh, for example, the Battle of Coral Sea, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. So those were the attempts by the Americans to try to regain control. But what they were all learning in this early stage of late 1941 into 1942 was the sheer importance of air power. It was vital to military success. And the Americans began to a massive building program of aircraft carriers, and they needed desperately air bases. Now, in order to uh, bring the war back to Imperial Japan's heartland, you had to try and get close to that Japanese mainland. The tyranny of distance means, and the limited technology of aircraft means, you've got to have air bases that are closer. But you can see circles in the middle of the map, top right, Midway Island, which the Americans possess. They've lost control of most of the other islands you can see in that sort of black dot dashed line. They've got to either um, get closer to the Japanese islands against the Japanese Navy so they can bombard them and destroy their industry, uh, or they've got to make their way slowly um, up through those islands of Southeast Asia to try and get air bases as they go along until they can get close enough. And you would see the line there just below the island of Okinawa, the sort of arc in red. And they've got to get that close to launch air attacks on a regular basis. So they've got the entirety of that part of the Pacific to get through. So the means then of their strategy were to build and operate more carriers and capture islands to build air bases. The ways were to bombard and interdict Japan's industrial base to prevent them being able to bring resources in and sustain their resistance. And the ends were to render Japanese resistance reduced and perhaps even cut off altogether. What they're trying to do in sum is to prevent Japan from waging war. But as I say, there is this tyranny of distance. There's also the strength of the Imperial Japanese to bear in mind here, as you sit at your desk in the White House. So the Japanese advances did not stop in December 1941. They went on all the way through 1942, through 1943, and into the summer of 1944. They reached the border of India in 1944, the Imperial Japanese, Despite desperate fighting at Imphal and Kohima, British, Indian and Burmese soldiers managed to just hang on to stop the Japanese invading uh, the, the entirety of India. There are attempts to push the Japanese back in Burma, which failed initially. An attempt to raid behind enemy lines under an organization called the Chindits, named after a mythical beast of Burmese history, um, these unfortunately failed. These were pinpricks. There was an attempt by the Americans to launch an air raid from great distance called the Doolittle Raid. That too achieved very little. It was merely symbolic. But what they were up against was an army that had been coached and taught not to surrender, to never give in. It was something called the Senjunkin, 
which meant it was like a code of honour, an idea that the orders for the emperor were divine. Who are we as mere mortals to stand in the way of the divine? Failure in carrying out your orders in this divine mission. Uh, by the way, the orders of the emperor were known as the Tenorsai, the imperial edict, the, the, the idea of the leadership principle, if you like. If you failed and you're about to bring dishonor, therefore, on the divine mission, it was considered honorable and appropriate that you would kill yourself in sepulchral, uh, in a kind of act of suicide. Now, if failure was imminent, but there was still an opportunity to overcome failure, then the idea was that you would launch one final whirlwind charge against your enemy, almost emulating the, the kamikaze wind that had saved Japan in medieval period, the so-called banzai, the final charge, the final effort to overwhelm your enemy. The Japanese would say in the period, duty is heavier than a mountain, but death is lighter than a feather. Now, the strategic options then, let's get really serious about these strategic options, um, because Admiral Ernest King, a rather prickly American naval officer who ran the American Navy, said, now, what we're going to do is we are going to send the US Navy from Midway Island across to Formosa, today known, of course, as Taiwan, and there we're going to build bases and we're going to launch our attacks as naval attacks on mainland uh, Japan. General Douglas MacArthur, a much more affable American general, fond of smoking his pipe, uh, who'd been kicked out of the Philippines but had vowed to return, managed to persuade the, the then president, Roosevelt, that a far more effective way was to build up towards Imperial Japan by an island hopping campaign all the way through uh, to Okinawa. And along the way, they would build air bases as they went. There was another officer who eventually took over. He was not originally the head of the US Army Air Force or USAAF, but he did take over later, General Curtis LeMay. And he argued that what they should do is build air bases in uh, the territory of their ally, China, and from there they should launch attacks on Japan. They did indeed do that for a while, and so the Japanese launched the Ichigo Offensive in 1944 and removed the ability of the Americans to operate within range of Imperial Japan. So General Douglas MacArthur's plan was the one that was adopted. So this island hopping campaign. And he, the argument was, we can build up resources uh, as we go. We're going to buy time to build more aircraft carriers. To give you an idea, at the Kaiser Shipyard in California, at the very, very end of the war, the last day of the war, there were 50 aircraft carriers under construction. That's the scale of American industry uh, writ large. But he was basically buying time. He said, we can train our troops on the go. We can uh, build our ships, build our carriers, build our submarines. And also, by the way, it builds time to deal with Germany first, as opposed to uh, dealing with Imperial Japan. Germany was considered to be a far greater threat, for the reasons my colleague has just pointed out. So off they went through... Uh, the Solomons, the Marianas, uh, fighting up to the Philippines, which took months and months to recapture, to eventually they got as far as Iwo Jima. The problem was the casualties. Japanese troops were very well fortified, incredibly well trained, and absolutely determined. The fighting was desperate and intense, and the Americans were suffering very heavy casualties indeed. The Japanese simply refused to surrender. They made themselves into human minds. They carried out sniping attacks. Even when they were captured, they would attempt to rip off their bandages in some cases and try to assail the men who were trying to help them. Extraordinary level of determination. And when they reached Okinawa, sorry, I'll just go back one, sorry, briefly. When they reached Okinawa, American losses in the capture of one island, American casualties were 49,151 of which 12,500 were killed in action. Remember, you're the American president sitting at your desk looking at those casualty figures coming in at this late stage of the war. What was really even more tragic was that Japanese civilians on Okinawa decided to commit mass suicide rather than surrender and be captured. The Americans were utterly appalled and astonished at the determination of the Japanese people to fight 
to the very end. So how do you end this war? Um, this is a summary of the things that we've just been talking about. What sort of post-war world, post -war world, get that right, do you wish to, to have? The intelligence estimates, first of all, in all this were that the Japanese merchant marine, all the shipping designed to supply Japan, was being cut off um, from the mainland. There were lots of shortages in Japan, but still the Japanese will not surrender. So option two is a, is a massive air campaign led by General Curtis LeMay, uh, the person I just talked about. There were bombings of factories and ports, um, and uh, the intelligence reports came back saying, we're not actually hitting the targets very effectively. Um, the Americans have been forced to fly at very, very high altitude to try and protect the pilots. The problem was that all the air mass movements meant that all of the uh, conventional explosives were not falling where they should do. So Curtis LeMay changed tactics, decided to fly a bit lower and drop incendiary bombs to burn out large sections of urban areas because the factories they were after were all inside those urban areas, unlike Germany, where they tend to be set off to one side. But still, the Japanese will not surrender. Tokyo was reduced to ashes in large parts by this incendiary attack, and still Japan would not surrender. What about the maritime option? The American Navy tried to get close to the Japanese mainland, but as they did so, as you can see from this illustration, they came under attack for over 1,200 kamikaze attacks. This is a suicide air attack by Japanese young men who have been morally pressured in many cases to fulfill Tenosai, uh, the great uh, imperial edict, and to sacrifice themselves in this final last ditch form of attack. If you think about it this way, um, only one pilot, if it hits the target, it can take down an entire ship, which may have up to 1,200 people on board. Okay? 20% of those attacks got through. You can do the maths. Large numbers of American uh, marine and uh, 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 naval personnel were dying, ships going to the bottom of the ocean, uh, so they needed a new approach. The amphibious air, uh, assaults, as I say, are clearly in, experience was indicating that the Japanese were not going to give up, that if they landed on the mainland with amphibious forces, uh, like, like Iwo Jima and like Okinawa, the Americans, uh, in terms of marines and army, are forecast to lose 900,000 casualties. 900,000 families, uh, husbands, wives, you know, friends are going to suffer those kind of losses. And on your desk is that plan as you sit there and contemplate whether or not you're going to use atomic weapons. The Japanese, by the way, if the islands are invaded, are going to lose 10 million largely civilian people killed and wounded. So, he asked for more information, Truman, as you would do. If I, if I extend this out a bit longer, perhaps we can just bring Japan to its knees by attrition uh, over time. The intelligence estimates came back. Yes, you can do that, Mr. President and the war will end in July of 1947. Two more years of this much killing is going to go on. The war, of course, had been initiated by a Japanese militaristic regime. It was not going to negotiate. That was the other uh, insight he's got. And what Truman really wants is a world without major war. He's already got in his head the idea of a United Nations organization where everyone can talk together to prevent wars happening on this scale ever again. He's got an idea for a World Bank, an international monetary fund. But well, we've got to get through this war first, is what he has to say. So Henry, Henry Stimson comes to him. There's old uh, Jay Roberts, so I'll come back to him in a moment. There's Stimson, um, the bespectacled individual um, top of the screen, uh, talking to Harry Truman. This is the initial letter, copy of the initial letter that he he obviously gave him back in April, but no detail. It wasn't really until June, July uh, that uh, Truman had any sort of sense about what this atomic weapon was going to do. Um, do you use the new weapon to end the war now or not use it, take the losses over the next two years? That is the decision that you face as president. Now, what you're going to do is do what I would do, go and consult the scientists. Let's go and ask them about this weapon 
and see what they say. The scientists are divided. Stimson found them, they couldn't agree. Um, nuclear energy, clearly very valuable, as we've heard, but a massive weapon. And uh, the fear of its misuse is driving a lot of the concerns by the scientists. Truman goes back and has another think. Should I share this with my allies? Should I internationalize this weapon system? Should I make sure that it's civilianized only for the use in energy production? Should I make sure that only civilians have control over it? That one he definitely decided on. Don't give it to the military to control. It must be controlled by civilians. It's too important to be left to the generals. The pressure's on. Every day that you delay in your decision, American personnel are dying under kamikaze attacks. And pilots are being shot down out of the skies by Japanese or many Japanese uh, air defense systems. The bombing is not producing the surrender. Chinese military officers are calculating that if we can inflict massive losses on the Americans, then the Americans will give up and our regime will survive. We can regenerate force and have another go in 10 years time. The United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps are ordered by Truman to prepare for amphibious conventional landings in Japan. Just imagine, you've been through Okinawa, you've been perhaps through Iwo Jima, you're a young man in your 20s, and you're told that you're going to be making an armed landing, a, a, a landing against the teeth of Japanese imperial forces on the mainland of Japan itself. Imagine how you feel. Your chances of survival are minimal. And Truman knows that. The Japanese authorities, even as late as July 1945, are preparing the Japanese people for one final, last, sacrificial stand. We are all going to die. School children are equipped with bamboo stakes with blades on the end in the hope that they can get close to American personnel and stab them from behind. A last-ditch battle indeed. And so therefore, in July, the decision is made Truman decides he's going to use this bomb. On the 6th of August, 1945, Hiroshima is reduced to what you can see on the screen in front of you. But Japan does not surrender. There's an intense debate inside the Japanese military state headquarters alongside the political leaders. Uh, opinion is desperately divided. and The Japanese come down in the end on deciding to continue resistance. Maybe the Americans have only got one of these devices and that's the end of it. So three days later on the 9th of August 1945, Nagasaki is destroyed in the second bomb. Then finally it dawns on the Japanese authorities, finally, that the systematic destruction of Japan is the only logical um, deduction they can reach from this weapon system. The unconditional surrender therefore comes just a little later, on the 2nd of September, 1945. So ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you again, under the circumstances that you heard, if you were Harry Truman in July of 1945, can I just show of hands how many of you would have used the nuclear option? The numbers are slightly greater, okay. It is, um, just finally to say, because I know that we're now going to have a sort of bit of a break, um, and. Uh, I think it's just worth mentioning that, in, in a finale, this is the most serious uh, thing I have to deal with in my academic career. Um, and I'm on secondment at the moment to the UK government. I speak on my own behalf here, I'm not speaking on behalf of the UK government. But I have to try and rectify and, and justify my own mind why, as a University of Oxford academic, I'm working with the government and why I have to deal with this question of the nuclear deterrence. And I'm looking forward to our discussion later uh, as I look forward to have that conversation about why does the UK possess such a devastating weapon system. Um, just to sort of put up there that we need to minimise these weapons whilst at the same time the United Kingdom wants to remain a credible actor uh, with this. We need to be accountable. We need to communicate with consistency why we have this system. We need to make sure it's very, very firmly controlled. We need to have this sense of overmatching military power to demonstrate to anyone who wishes to do us and our friends harm that the cost would outweigh the benefit to any aggressor to use such a system against us. But above all, to prevent and to deny harms of major wars 
such as the scale of the Second World War, in which we think over 50, potentially 60 million people died in that conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience.